Good evening. I want to welcome everyone tonight. Welcome to uh, our Westmont Downtown program. My name is Mark Sargent. I'm the Provost at Westmont. It's a pleasure to have you out here for this event, one of these conversations that matter. Our series is uh, uh, co-sponsored by the Westmont <coughs> Foundation and it's a chance for us to feature some of the uh, outstanding faculty that we have at Westmont and to, to share those faculty with you as a, a gift to the community and you have um, a treat I think tonight with one of our um, best loved faculty members. Uh, this is the final fourth and the final of our series this year. We'll be gathering shortly to determine what the themes will be for next year and if anyone would like to give a suggestion or make a make a recommendation about what kind of topic we would cover. We have some forms in the back uh, on, the, on the tables with the tablecloth. Just grab one before you go and uh, there's some pens back there and you can fill out and make some suggestions that we will consider when we, we gather to choose. It's a real pleasure for me to, tonight to introduce to you Don Patterson who is an associate professor of computer science at Westmont. Uh, he has a personal website. If you go to his personal website he's described as a professor who develops people and ideas. And that really rings true. Uh, in my two years of working with Don, the two years that he's been with us, I have grown to richly admire the way that he has just the ability to set technical, sophisticated, mathematical computer questions in the context of human experience and, and human values. And he keeps us alert not only to what the innovations are in technology, but also to what the moral implications of that technology are for our lives. Uh, he has an encyclopedic uh, range of interests. He's, he's a scholar with a very lively imagination who is always creating new things and probing new boundaries and really modeling the spirit of liberal arts inquiry which we value so much at Westmont. Don completed his undergraduate degree and his first master's degree at Cornell University and then he completed a second master's degree and a PhD in computer science at the University of Washington. In the midst of all this, he also served as a navigation and operations officer with the United States Navy uh, and was originally stationed in Sardinia, Italy and then was deployed to the, the Persian Gulf. Before joining Westmont uh, a couple years ago, he was a tenured faculty member at the University of California, Irvine. We are very grateful we were able to uh, to, to get him to, to leave Irvine and to come join us here in Santa Barbara. And he, and he was recently a co-founder of the new master's degree in human computer interaction at UCI. He, uh, he has written multiple new courses and programs including a capstone course in trans reality. Other courses have uh, focused on topics such as global disruption and information technology and his scholarly work, um, uh, his, his publications, presentations, you know, articles and books, uh, chapters have won multiple awards. He's, he's just a remarkably creative person. Uh, he designs computer-assisted Christmas trees for the science building. Uh, he has a, developed a greenhouse behind uh, the office building at, at Westmont. He, he demonstrates the use of drones on campus uh, and blends a spirit of creativity and fun with a concern for academic quality and social justice. It's a real pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Don Patterson to you. Don. Wow, I'm sort of curious who that was who was describing. So, yeah, it's an honor to be able to um, come tonight and speak. I'm very gratified that you all um, came out to hear what I have to say. I hope that um, as we have a conversation, I guess mostly I'm going to be having a conversation, but um, that you'll leave with some tools, um, both knowledge about what's going on in the world of big data, um, some ways of thinking about big data, and also maybe some technical things that you might want to try out when you leave to um, uh, take control a little bit of your, um, of your digital world. Um, so uh, thank you. Um, so tonight's talk is called Should We Hide from Big Data? And I was going to introduce myself, but I think maybe I can just skip that. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. So big data. Uh, what are we talking about exactly when we talk about big data? Uh, how does it get used? Uh, where do we see it? How is it being used well and how is it being used poorly? I kind of want to talk about all of those things. This is a road map of what I'd like to cover tonight. And let's start by asking what is big data? Um, from a technological standpoint, there's kind of an uh, agreement about what big data is. Uh, basically, it's a broad term for data sets that are just so large or complex 
that traditional data processing applications are just inadequate. Um, there's so much data involved with big data that it becomes hard to just capture it, to store it, to curate it, give it some structure, to analyze it, to search it, to share it, to transfer, transfer it, to visualize it, and to protect people's privacy um, among, during this whole time period. That's a technical standpoint. There's kind of a business angle to it as well. And from a business standpoint, big data is more something along the lines of a term that's used to talk about using a lot of data to do smarter, faster, and more insightful data analysis. So kind of what can you do with it? and How can that benefit our organization or our business? So how do you know if what you're working with qualifies as big data? Well, it gets bigger and bigger, and it's gotten bigger and bigger over time. But one of the first ways that you know that you're dealing with data that doesn't fit traditional boundaries is that Microsoft Excel crashes when you try and load it up. You have reached some kind of a boundary with your data that requires new techniques. You might find that the computer doesn't fit in the memory of one computer anymore. And as soon as, com as, soon as um, data doesn't fit in the memory of a computer, then it quickly becomes harder and slower to process. Maybe the data doesn't fit on the disk of the computer anymore, and you run out of disk space as a result. And maybe you find that it's taking so much time that it actually would take several days or months or years to process that data on one computer anyway. You may find that the amount of data that you're working with, you have to use words like terabytes. Um, this is a terabyte. It's about one billion bytes. Uh, you might be using words like petabytes, uh, one that was one trillion, one quadrillion bytes, or perhaps an exabyte, which is one quintillion bytes. Um, so that's sort of an enormous number. It's hard to get our head around that. Um, an exabyte is about how much data it would be required in order to um, record every word that has been spoken by every person in every language ever. That's one, that's uh, two exabytes. Google has 15 of them. Uh, that they're keeping track of all the various kinds of data that are around. So it's an enormous number, but it's a number that we're working with now in, in, our, in our data centers. Not my data centers, but Google's data centers for sure. Um, so where is it all coming from? W what's all this data being generated by? Well, from our consumer perspective, there's a lot of places that you might be familiar with that are generating some of this data. So here's an example of what happens in one internet minute in 2016. It's a little hard to read, so let me um, just give you a couple points on this wheel. Uh, if you look in the upper right, Uber, which is uh, kind of a taxi service, and every minute about um, 1,400 Uber rides are summoned. So that's every minute. Um, if you know Tinder, the dating app, about every, every minute, one million swipes are hit on a Tinder app. Uh, maybe another interesting point on there is that there are 2.78 million videos watched every minute. And every one of those activities isn't just generating one byte of data, it's generating hundreds or thousands or millions of bytes of data as pictures are stored and things are communicated. That's a very consumer-focused uh, way to look at big data. There are other places that big data are being generated. So for example, the Google self-driving cars, they create about 45 gigabytes per minute of data. And what, what does that come from? Well, it comes from things like laser scanners on the cars, which are reading the landscape of the environment around them and generating, this is a visualization of what the car in the center is capturing. The green dots represent reflections from laser light that's coming from the car and is being used to create a three-dimensional model of the world around the car so it doesn't hit things. Um, so 45 gigabytes per minute. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about big data. A lot of it being generated by consumer activities, but also being generated by a lot of activities that maybe we wouldn't encounter on a daily basis unless we're in one of these industries. Well, how then does it get used? Uh, big data isn't just collected for no reason. We use it for a lot of different purposes. If we consider maybe Amazon, Amazon's one of the um, largest providers of infrastructure for big data. You may be familiar with them as a site where you buy books and um, you know, other products, but in fact, they open up all of their um, processing facilities as well to developers who would like to build their own big data um, warehouses. So if you are shopping for a grill, maybe, like this Weber grill, as you are looking at the grill, you are generating trails of data as you browse that product and you browse other products. Every time you look at a new product, Amazon is recording that for all of the people that are looking at all of the products all at once. 
And of course, sometimes you're manually entering data. For example, in this case where you're entering reviews for a product, you're rating them, giving them a certain number of stars, taking pictures of your grill, I guess, and uploading it to Amazon. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not sure who has the time to do that, but some people do. Um, and from this, you get sort of a pretty rich experience of uh, what buying this grill is going to be like for you. Well, that data then can get aggregated. And everyone who's browsing the grills at the same time can uh, produce um, a, uh, some reports like who else, what else do people who were looking at this grill also look at? That's created because all the data about people browsing is all being aggregated together. What else who, uh, do people who bought this grill buy? Well, grill covers and charcoal starters. And in fact, what do they buy at the same time? And um, Amazon will do you the favor of putting those together in one shopping basket for you if you'd like to just buy them all, all at once. Because other people have done it, so certainly you would like to do it as well. Right? So this is great. These are, I would argue that these are pretty good services, well done, helpful for the most part. Um, a lot of other ways in which big data is leveraged. Um, some of them good, um, some of them bad, and some of them a little bit ugly. So let's um, kind of expand our scope a little bit of where big data is being used. So big data started as, a, as search engines. So Google was one of the first creators of big data systems, and they used it so that you could have a search engine. And in order to do that, they had to crawl the internet and collect all the web pages that they could find and make them accessible to people as they searched for things. Um, inventory control. Walmart has an enormous data center, something like 30 petabytes of data, where they're keeping track of transactions and inventory, so that when you walk into Trader Joe's or Walmart, um, there's milk there, there's whatever you're looking for, and as they run low, automatic, in, uh, automatic requests to their uh, distribution center are being made, so that you know, people on the floor don't have to worry quite as much as they otherwise would have, and they can keep their inventory in the stores low. Trader Joe's doesn't have to have a huge store, they can have a small store because they're constantly getting deliveries that are being generated by data systems. Automatic translation is generated by um, lots of dual texts that are in two languages that are automatically being synthesized by a system. There are transformations in genetics and pharmaceutical research. For example, uh, GenBank, which is a database that consists of all of the publicly available DNA sequences that are known. And you can go and you can look at them, both the metadata for them as well as the nucleotides that are available. Traffic rerouting, targeted advertising. This is a um, headline from the New York Times which, um, it, if you weren't aware, you're getting personalized advertisements. And in this case, I was getting advertised a recommendation to participate in a grilled cheese contest. <laughs> so, I'm not sure based what, on based on my <laughs> cheesiness, I, I'm not sure what, I'm not sure what's generating that, but something problematic, I need to work on that. Um, remind me to get milk on the way home. Reminders like that require monitoring GPS and um, working with multiple systems. Uh, sex offender bracelets are an example of big data. So these are bracelets that people who have been convicted of various um, sex-related crimes uh, may be required by a court to wear them after the fact to make sure that they don't travel uh, within regions typically close to schools and playgrounds, um, constantly monitoring and updating that data. Software project management, tracking food to make sure it doesn't spoil, and hazardous waste. All things that I would say on the balance are quite good. Um, you may have heard this story. This is where things turn a little bit and start to get a little bit disconcerting. So about, um, about five or six years ago, uh, a man in Minneapolis uh, went to go pick up the mail. And in the mail, he found um, a number of flyers and advertisements. And those advertisements were um, suggesting that his teenage daughter, they were advertised to his teenage daughter, should buy diapers and formula and maybe a stroller or a baby carrier. And he got very, very upset about this as a father of this teenage daughter. That's absolutely inappropriate. Um, and so he immediately went into the Target and talked to the manager and tried to explain that, you know, what do you think you're doing? You're are you encouraging my daughter to get pregnant? What, what is this? That's not appropriate for our family and uh, her relationship status. Um, and so he went home. Um, and had a difficult conversation a couple weeks later when his daughter told him that, in fact, she was pregnant. And that Target had discovered it before she had had an opportunity to talk to her father about it. Um, and, was, you know, and that this advertisement ended up revealing um, this fact about the daughter. Now, it's very valuable for a store to be able to identify when a child is born because at that moment, you have 
something like 18 to 21 years of advertising opportunities. <laughs> from the diapers, to the kindergarten back to school sale, to the soccer team, to the college prep tests. If you keep track of it, you know times of you know, normal, regular social events that happen that are all possible to be marketed to. So the, I'm going to um, read from a New York Times article about how this works. Um, the data analyst ran t from Target ran test after test analyzing the data, and before long, some useful patterns emerged. Lotions, for example. Lots of people buy lotion. But one of the data analyst's colleagues noticed that women on the baby registry were buying larger quantities of unscented lotion around the beginning of their second trimester. Another analyst noted that sometime in the first 20 weeks, pregnant women started loading up on supplements like calcium, magnesium, and zinc. Many shoppers purchase soap and cotton balls, but when someone suddenly starts buying lots of scent-free soap and extra big bags of cotton balls, in addition to hand sanitizers and washcloths, it signals that they could be getting close to their delivery date. So tar Target assigns a pregnancy score to all of the people who shop there. And if you go over a certain level, now they'll send you advertisements for baby stuff, but they, they mix it in to no other kinds of advertisements, so you don't realize that you're being targeted. So another example is China. China is trying to organize a citizen uh, score, a citizen social credit score. And um, this project, uh, launched in um, 2010, gives citizens points for good behavior, up to a maximum of, of 1,000. But a minor tra violation of traffic rules would cost someone 20 points, and running a red light, driving while drunk, or paying a bribe would cost 50. Some of the penalties showed the party's desire to regulate its citizens' private lives. Participating in anything deemed to be a cult or failing to care for elderly relatives incurred a 50-point pen penalty. Other penalties reflected the party's obsession with maintaining public order and crushing any challenge to its authority, causing a disturbance that blocks party or government offices meant 50 points off. Using the internet to falsely accuse others resulted in a 100-point deduction. Winning a national honor, such as being classified as a model citizen or worker, added 100 points to someone's score. And on this basis, and this is maybe the critical part, citizens were classified into four levels. They were given an A grade qualified for government support when starting a business and preferential treatment when applying to join the party, government, or army, or applying for a promotion. People with D grades were excluded from official support or employment. So a little bit of a darker turn on what big data can be used for. Similar things have happened with um, um, sh loyalty club cards in the US. Vons Club um, attempted to introduce evidence about shopping behavior for an individual who slipped in their store and subsequently sued the store. Vons tried to introduce evidence about alcohol purchases to demonstrate that this person may not have been sober at the time. Ultimately, that data didn't get entered into the court, the evidence of the court, but it was available and you know, could be leveraged um, because it exists. So the trend is a little bit stranger, and I think the thing that's strange about the trend is that this data is getting more physical, and it's not being generated so much by your online interactions, but by your engagement with the world. So your license plates are being read. When you get an ATM transaction, your location at the ATM is recorded. Your phone, of course, is checking in with cell phone towers and recording your location, and your Fitbit records location and activity levels. So if you're an Android user, this is an example of the kind of data that Google is collecting about where you go. Maybe not too crazy. This is demonstrating a bunch of points uh, where an unknown person has um, been located. But if you drill down into the data, it's actually much more sophisticated. Uh, this is showing tracks around town where the person is going. And if you look at the upper right, the color coding is indicating what mode of transportation the person was taking from point to point. So this data is just for one day, but it's being collected quite frequently. And if you go into your Google, if you have an Android device and you go into your Google settings, you can see all the different tracks that Google has for you. And of course, your phone is are collecting steps. And you have things like a Nest, which is an artificial intelligence thermostat, or your Amazon Echo, which is constantly um, listening for um, you to tell it to do things, I guess. Um, but that data has been also subpoenaed by um, law enforcement to try and get evidence. Um, a famous one is about a murder that occurred in a home. The law enforcement tried to get the audio from the Amazon Echo to prove their case. So all of this leads to an interesting situation where this guy at his desk says, I think my Nest smoke alarm is going off. Google AdWords just pitched me a fire extinguisher and an offer for temporary housing. All right, so that's a lot. That's a lot of data. That's a lot of things that are going on. 
So let me give you two ways that we have to think about how we can uh, process this kind of data. So these are really two metaphors for um, big data. And the first one is called the panopticon. And the panopticon goes back quite a ways. It, it, it comes from the um, end of the 18th century from a gentleman named Jeremy Bentham. Here's a picture of him up on the left. He's got a guy that kind of reminds me of Ben Franklin in a lot of ways. And what he did is he introduced the idea of a kind of prison. And the prison was round and it had a guard tower in the center and it was surrounded by a bunch of cells that were open to the center but not open to each other. So it kind of maybe looked like the inside of a uh, ear of corn maybe, if, if you're looking out at the kernels. Um, it was interesting and he designed it this way for some very specific reasons and then a theorist named Michel Foucault looked at it as a way of understanding how we think about surveillance. Now the thing about this prison that was interesting is that the prisoners never knew when the guard in the center tower was looking at them. And as a result, there could be far fewer guards than was, were typically necessary. The prisoners would end up um, behaving well because they never knew if a guard was watching them. And this was the um, gist of what Foucault talked about. He said that um, the discipline that was going on in this prison wasn't being generated by guards, but it was people doing it to themselves because they felt like they were being watched and they, by, and they didn't know what to do about it. This has become now basically the dominant model for the way that we think about surveillance in the modern age. And, and w in what way? What am I talking about? Well, if you walk into a store and you see a monitor like this up on the ceiling, what that store is telling you is that you're being watched. And so they expect you to monitor yourself, to not do anything wrong uh, because you're being watched. Now, actually, you don't know if you're being watched or not. That could just be you know, a camera feed that um, no one is watching. You could have lots of cameras or no cameras, but you end up sort of disciplining yourself. If you take this to a, um, kind of a, a, a pretty extensive extension, um, the, big the panopticon metaphor says that big data is about being watched. It's a very visual metaphor, and it says that collecting data is bad for you if you're being watched. The collection is non-disruptive. It's not taking any of your time. But the data is centralized and somewhere there are files on you. Very secret police kind of um, model. Um, it's very territorial. There are some places where surveillance is okay, the public spaces. There are other places where surveillance is not okay. The home, maybe bathrooms, things like that. And what this causes you to do, if this is your primary model of big data, is it causes you to reorganize your movement as you go through the world in light of where you're being watched and where you're not being watched. Um, and in that way, the surveillance becomes internalized. You start owning that surveillance on your own and start reacting as a result. So a different way of thinking about um, surveillance, though, is something that um, computer scientists think of as the capture model. The capture model look, approaches the problem really differently. It says, well, you know what? We've al always been taking data. You know, when I go to the store and I buy something, there's always been a receipt. And wouldn't it be great if we just kept that data rather than just turning it over in paper? Let's just keep a record of it. Because if we have a record of it, well, we're going to be able to get some value out of it, and keeping a record of it is pretty cheap. So we'll just keep that data around. And oh, when you swipe your card to get into a building, well, it's convenient to open the door for you, but we'll just keep track of when you opened it because maybe that'll help us do something better in the future. Or if you want to keep track of where packages are, oh, we'll just scan it at every step along the way because then we can tell you when the package is going to arrive. Facial recognition. Well, now I can just give you pictures of the people that you care about, and I'll know which pictures are available, and maybe all the demographic data that's in Facebook down here at the bottom, where you enter your job and where you live and your phone number. Well, this is just helpful for helping you to connect to other people. And so this is a really different way of thinking about the data. It's not fundamentally different. It's just ways of um, structuring the world. And in this view, um, big data is about understanding, having the computers understand what's happening. And in this view, collecting data is really good for you, and, it, and it's primarily about trying to understand what's meaningful. The data's got to be parsed and synthesized. It's not in a central place. The goal is to correlate this data, um, perhaps link it to other data. And surveillance is kind of a byproduct. It gets piggybacked along the way, but it's not the goal. And instead of thinking about movement in terms of avoiding or being in surveillance or not, you start to think about the world in terms of um, changing your behavior so that the right things get captured about you and the wrong things aren't captured. And so it's more about making your movement visible or legible to the computer. So you see this maybe in the TSA lines where there's a bunch of data that's being collected about you, about security, but we also totally reorganize the way that people flow through the airports in order to support this capture. 
And the fact that we do that then makes it possible to capture other data in new ways. And so this model thinks more about work reorganization than it does about surveillance. So if we go back to the, the, the target model and we think about the target model in these two different ways, if we think about it from the panopticon perspective, it's kind of creepy. There's someone watching us, they figured out when we were pregnant, we're kind of getting punished by having that data revealed. But if you think about it from the capture model, well, it was actually a nice service that Target was providing. They were able to give us um, discounts when we were pregnant. They knew beforehand. Maybe they're making it easier. It doesn't change the fact that what happened was pretty disturbing. But whether you see it as sort of a dark, evil overlord, or whether you see it as just computer systems that kind of went wrong, depends a little bit on your perspective. In both cases, though, there are some risks. In the Panopticon model, we have this uh, risk of freedom being suppressed. We lose our ability to control our self-presentation, and notably, we lose our ability for political dissent, which was the nature of what Edward Snowden did when he released all the documents demonstrating that the government was collecting a lot of data about our communications. He was really leaning into this panopticon model, and kind of with good reason, because there was a central organization collecting all of our communications, <laughs> still is. Um, in the, um, in the capture model, it's a little bit different. So the risk is intellectual and imagination, imaginative freedom is being suppressed. And that's because every time you move in this world, you're triggering a sequence of digital events that are being parsed and monitored. And that might cost you money, it might communicate to other systems, and you stop having the ability to think clearly because you pick up a book and you start reading it, and if that book is being monitored, and what pages you're reading are being monitored, and which paragraphs you spend more time on are being monitored, or when you go places, it affects your citizen score, you know, you start not being able to just do something. You have to start thinking about all the knock-on effects that happen. And then those actions can be monetized. So this is an example, probably hard to read in the back, but it's, it says the internet of ransomware things. And so, uh, like right here, this has an example of the, net, the nest, and the, it, the nest is saying, I'm turning off the heat until you warm up my bank account. Uh, and this, this one right here says, is a broom, and it says, send me $25 or I'll tell everyone on your social network that you were stupid enough to buy an internet-connected broom. <laughs> so this is, this is a place where all these things are, are, are now, you know, choke points for the ability to control our data and to control what things we do. Well, then what should we do about this? How should we live in response to all of these different opportunities and, um, and perils, I guess? And I think the thir first thing that I want to um, be clear about is that I don't think this is fundamentally going to be solved by technology. What, what we're experiencing is not really a technological problem. It's really a social issue and an ability to collectively decide what it is we think should be in and out of bounds. And so, my argument at the highest level is that we need to actively pursue and support legislation that can put reasonable limits in place. So on the right here is a full page ad that was recently taken out that was basically shaming the senators who recently voted to overturn the FCC rules for allowing ISPs to sell your network data without your consent. So this is an example of someone doing their best to try and control the legislative situation. Because ultimately what we don't want is we don't want to walk around feeling like prey. We don't want to feel like technology at any given moment is going to take advantage of us because we're going to start acting like prey and the computers will start acting like predators. And that's just not a world we want to live in. So we need to fight against that. So what can we do? Well, one thing we can do is we can just give up and submit. Well, that's easy now, but in the long run we end up losing our freedom. So I don't like that one. Um, we can try and disappear. Uh, you can try and go off grid and I would argue that this is really no longer possible. Um, you know, honestly, between smartphones and global finance and video cameras, you can maybe go camping, but you can't go off-grid really indefinitely. That's, that's really not feasible. You can actively rebel. You could, like, take it upon yourself to start destroying the infrastructure of surveillance by, I don't know, smashing this, the video cameras and destroying the computers. I don't think that's going to work out very well. Um, so that's unlikely to find sympathy because these systems are also the things, you know, that are doing, you know, are making our photo albums nice and, um, you know, delivering a lot of services that we appreciate. Another thing that we could do is we could lie. We could lie to these systems. And the thing about lying to these systems, uh, or the, the example of these systems and lying to these systems that bothers me the most, I think, right now, um, is the suggestion that we might have um, registries, um, for example, a Muslim registry. 
So um, a database or a system somewhere where, where people who are Muslim are expected to register their belief. And in that case, it's, it's likely not going to be just Muslims. It'll probably be anyone who has a faith um, belief. Um, I really wonder what is OK about lying to that, situ in, to that database. If you are Muslim yourself and you choose to lie to that database, that's one thing. But what about if you're not Muslim and you want to support Muslim people and lie that you are Muslim to make the data not very helpful? Is that OK? And I want to just for a second lean into Westmont's Christian um, uh, identity and be normative for a second and tell you what I think you should do. Um, and <laughs> I, I just kind of want to make the point that lying um, from a biblical perspective, it's just a very clear and adamant call not to do it. Um, uh, it's explicitly stated in Proverbs. And ultimately, it's rooted in corruption and really aligns you with evil. Um, it, 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 it comes from a fear of losing personal esteem and the fear of personal harm. And as it's almost Easter, we can think of the story of Peter who denied Christ. Denied Christ. He was um, fearing for his life. I'll, I'll impute some motive to him. Fearing for his life, lied that he didn't know Jesus because Jesus was in the process of being tortured. Um, he didn't want that. And yet, later in the, later in the Gospels, it's, um, he's, he's um, called out for not doing the right thing in that circumstance. And so even in this case, his lying was not okay. And we can also look to the example of Jesus in this case, who, um, you know, who, who in the Passion Week lost a lot of personal esteem and suffered a lot of harm because he refused to lie. However, um, there are a couple other examples in the Bible as well. And as John Piper says, it does seem that it's possible to be a person who fears the Lord, walks by faith, faith and yet feels constrained in extreme life-threatening situations to oppose evil by lying intentionally. This occurred two notable places in the Bible, both of which entailed protection of the powerless. Um, one was when Rahab, who was a prostitute, protected two people who were on the run from effectively secret police. They were spies and trying to escape an evil government. And the other one was Egyptian midwives who were ordered by Pharaoh to kill babies. And they refused to and then lied to cover their tracks. In both of these cases, they were commended later in, in other places in the Bible, not for their lying, but for their faith. Um, if, if you're not compelled by the scriptures, you could also look to the example protection of Jews during the Holocaust as an extreme example of a situation where perhaps despite our desire to live truthful lives, there could be some understanding of the evil being so severe that it would be all right. The problem here is, is lying to the database the same thing as lying to a person? And this is a really tricky question to answer, because I wouldn't recommend lying to the IRS, entering something incorrect into the database of your taxes. And yet, what if you lie to Facebook so that you're older or younger or a different gender, so that you stop getting Viagra ads? So, you know, what if you get really sick of it? And so you become, you know, I, right, you know, I changed my gender to female so that instead I get pearls and pearl ads and coach handbag ads, I guess. Um, is that the same? Is that lying in the same way? So how ought we to live? I think we shouldn't lie as much as possible. It's extremely difficult to justify. But I would say that lying to databases in many cases is more like camouflage. Camouflage is an example of effectively lying, but it feels very different. You would never send a soldier into war without camouflage on, and yet it's a deceptive act. So I think there are ways that we can resist some of this capture that don't rise to the level of lying to another person. For example, you can opt out when you can, you can mess with your data when you can't, and you can just make it hard for people to track you. So I go with the resist option. So let me shift gears for a second, and I'm going to give you some practical things uh, that you can do if you're concerned about one particular way in which people are tracking you or, or you have a particular threat. Now, in computer science, whenever you talk about security or privacy, it's always really important to identify the thing that you're concerned about, because you're never going to be able to um, stop every kind of tracking. And so you have to be clear about what it is you want to, um, how you want to change the data or change the data trail. So let me start with desktop computing. There are a couple things that you can do to mitigate some of the threats that I've talked about. 
The first three here are browser extensions. And the first one is called HTTPS Everywhere. And this is a simple extension that whenever you're surfing the web, tries to upgrade the security of your connection as much as possible at any given moment. And this plugin specifically counteracts what was just approved by the Senate um, in terms of allowing ISPs to sell your information. So if you installed HTTPS anywhere, you can call up the senators and say, eh, didn't matter. The other thing you can do is you can install Privacy Badger. Privacy Badger is a plugin which will prevent websites from tracking you over time by messing up the cookies that they store in your browser. So this means that when you go from one, one website to another website, they won't be able to correlate that you were there. A third one is kind of playful. It's called Track Me Not. And Track Me Not was um, developed by some academic researchers at NYU. And what it does is while you're using your browser, it opens up another browser tab and just enters queries into Google that you don't know about. All kinds of things. And it just searches and searches and searches for all kinds of stuff, leaving a trail that messes up the modeling of who you are. So whatever Google sees you searching for really has nothing to do with what you're doing because track me not, it's just entering queries about, in my case, it was a lot of Justin Bieber and uh, uh, Taylor Swift and it's messing up my data for sure, yeah. <laughs> There's a setting that you can turn on which is do not track. This is a minor thing, it's easy to do. But it's, a, it's a voluntary um, response from web, web uh, companies but it's something you can do. You can also consider a virtual private network, which is a connection with sometimes your office or you can buy them privately. That completely makes all of your connections through your ISP dark. Yeah, you know what? I will make these slides available to you if you would like. I, um, if you search on my website, uh, www.djp3.net, I'll put a copy of the slides right under uh, the picture of the surveillance camera, so if you want to get them. All right, in mobile computing, here's some things that you can do. Um, you can use the Signal app. So Signal is an encrypted communications tool. You can make phone calls with it and you can do text messaging over it. And it has very strong uh, security that prevents your messages from being detected in between the two destinations. Um, this is um, very popular in the academic community because the source code is available for review and it's been vetted as being very strong security. You can also use a VPN on your mobile computing as well. And this prevents your cell phone company from knowing what you're doing on the network. You should also, as a matter of just kind of mobile hygiene, turn off your application access. You shouldn't allow applications to have access to location or microphone, your contacts, your camera, except that the ones that you know need it. So your map should have access to your location. Uh, you know, you shouldn't go overboard on this. You should resist, you should make it hard, but you should still be able to get some of the functionality from these apps if you want them. That's desktop, that's mobile. What about embodied computing? So here's some things that you could do. You could send your phone on a holiday. Just turn it off. Because when your phone is off, it's dark. And no one at the cell phone company knows what you're doing. And you can just, you know, turn it off for a little while and create dark spots in your data. You can also let someone else carry it if they're going on a trip. And then all of a sudden, there's a trail of your phone that has nothing to do with you. And what this does is it creates what we call plausible deniability. It allows you to say, you know, sometimes I don't carry my phone. So that trail that you connected about me, I don't know who that was. I sometimes leave my phone on my dog. <laughs> you should physically block your cameras. So the cameras that are on your laptop, you should put a little um, post-it note or something like that over your cameras because those are pretty easy to get into by hackers and they can watch you remotely. You should mess with your loyalty card systems. When you go to Ace Hardware and they ask you what your card number is, give them your best friend's number. And what that's going to do, admit, you probably should check with your best friend first. But what that enables you to do is it enables you, the, you to get the benefits of the loyalty card, your friend to get the benefits of the points, but it messes up the data. The models are no longer accurate about who you are, and so that gives you some level of protection. The plenty cards, if you're familiar with that, that's a loyalty card system that, tracks many, tr uh, that um, spans many different companies. Trade them with people. Every now and then, have a best friend, and you just swap them back and forth and use them while, one on another. Register your Starbucks card with your account and then trade it with someone else who's registered their Starbucks card for the same amount. And now your data has nothing to do with you anymore. Um, browsers have incognito modes. Uh, use that. There's no reason not to. It protects um, your computer against um, cookies and various tracking locally. And the last thing I want to leave you with is some ways to resist that might be fun. So here are some things that you could do that might be fun. 
You could record a fake conversation and play it for Google Now or, or Siri or Amazon Echo and just let your recording play on loop like you might train a parrot uh. and see what happens with your advertisements. <laughs> see if you can get your advertisements to you know, whatever you're playing your conversation about just to experiment with what's happening. You can dirty your data. We did this as an experiment at Westmont with our students around Halloween. We um, encouraged them to see what the parameters were in this space by going on a fake vacation on fa Facebook. So we asked them to tell their peers that they were about to do this, and then they put photos of a place that they made up a story about where they were traveling and tagged themselves in Hawaii or Paris. And some of our students got very into it and dressed up and took selfies of, selfies of themselves with berets and stuff on and um, made up a totally fake story. Change your demographics on Facebook so you don't get the pearl ads or the coach bags, whatever you're trying to avoid. Celebrate the 4th of July by erasing all the cookies on your computer all at once. That will reset all the tracking for you for another year. Then finally, misspell your name on forums intentionally and just see when that misspelled name comes back to you so you can see how your data was traded around the systems behind, behind the scenes. So that's all I have for you. Um, in the slides, I have some links to the places where some of this information came from if you would like to learn more, and I can provide that for you afterwards. But I appreciate your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you have for me now. Thank you.